In this lesson, I am going to talk about dimension of a vector space. Let us recall this theorem from our last video lecture. We learned that if a vector space V has one basis with n vectors, then every basis for V has n vectors. This means that the number of elements in a basis is always the same regardless of the choice of basis. Hence, we can now define the dimension of a vector space as follows. If a vector space V has a basis consisting of n vectors, then this number n, the number of elements in your basis, is called the dimension of V and is denoted by this symbol. If Z consists of the zero vector alone, the dimension of V is defined as zero. Let us take a look at some examples. What would be the dimension of Rn? Rn has a standard basis consisting of the following vectors, correct? So therefore, the dimension of Rn is equal to n. What about the dimension of Pn? We already know a standard basis for Pn and that is the set 1, x, x squared up to xn. So therefore, the dimension of Pn is equal to n plus 1. You have n plus 1 of these elements. So do not forget, Pn has dimension n plus 1. What about the dimension of the set of matrices of size m by n? A standard basis for this would be your Eijs, where i runs from 1 to m, j runs from 1 to n because you have m rows and you have n columns. And therefore, how many elements do we have over here? We have m times n elements. Let's take a look at some examples. We want to find the dimension of each subspace of R3. To find the dimension of this subspace, of course, we have to find a spanning set. To do that, let's get an arbitrary element in W. Write it in such a way that your variables are separate from each other. So what I mean is I will have D negative D0 and then here plus 0 C. So I collected all my D's, D negative D and then 0 and then all my C. You have no C here and then you have C, C. And therefore I can write this as I can pull out my D so we have 1, negative 1, 0, plus, pull out your C, 0, 1, 1. And therefore, spanning set would be, I'll call this SS, spanning set would be the set containing 1, negative 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1. That would be your spanning set. Next, check for... Linear independence. Is it linearly independent? Well, in this case, it's very easy to check that it is linearly independent because our set consists of two vectors only. How do we check if a set containing two vectors is linearly independent or not? You just have to check if they are scalar multiples of each other. Obviously, these two are not scalar multiples of each other, so therefore, yes. It is linearly independent. So therefore, this set is actually a basis. Since this is a basis for W, the dimension of W is now equal to 2. Next, we have this set over here. First step, find a spanning set. Since an arbitrary element is 2B, B0, then this is just scalar multiple of 2, 1, 0. So a spanning set would be 2, 1, 0. And is this linearly independent? Since we only have one vector, how do you check whether a set containing one vector is linearly independent or not? As long as it is not the zero vector, it is linearly independent. Yes, it is linearly independent because it consists of one non-zero vector. So therefore, this set over here is a basis and hence the dimension of W is equal to 1. Let us consider another example. 
W is a subspace of all symmetric matrices in M22. What is the dimension of this subspace? Let us first write the elements of W. How will the elements of W look like? Since they are symmetric matrices, I can have, let's say, A, B here. This can be anything. But for this to be symmetric, if I put a C here, then it should also be C over here. Then A, B, C are just real numbers. So just like what we did earlier, get an arbitrary element. So an arbitrary element would be 2 by 2 matrices wherein these entries can be anything but the 1, 2, and 2, 1 entries has to be the same. So remember class that whenever you're given something, you have to be able to interpret how an element in that particular set looks like. Going back to this one, I will separate all my constants. This is A0, 0, and then for B, 0, 0, 0, B. And for my C, I have 0, C, C, 0. And therefore, I can write this as A, 1, 0, 0, plus B, 0, 0, 1, plus C times 0, 1, 0, 0. A spanning set would be this three matrices over here. Now, I will leave it up to you as an exercise to show that this is really linearly independent. Yes. So, therefore, the dimension of W is equal to 3. Now, in these examples that I showed you, all the spanning sets that we had turned out to be linearly independent. Well, it is not always the case. In our next lesson, I will show you examples wherein the spanning sets are not linearly independent, and I will show you how to get a linearly independent set out of that. Here is what we call basis test in an n-dimensional vector space. Let V be a vector space of dimension n, and S is a subset of V containing n elements. Dimension of V is equal to n, and it's the same as the number of elements in S. If S is linearly independent, then S is automatically a basis for V. And if S spans V, then S is a basis for V as well. This basis test is very helpful because remember that to check if something is a basis, you have to check for two conditions, linear independence and for it to be a spanning set, correct? However, this theorem tells us that if we already know that your set S has n elements, it remains to show that it satisfies only one of these conditions, all right? So for example, let us determine whether this set is a basis for P3. Always check the cardinality first. I will call this S, and the cardinality of S here is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. But the dimension of P3 is equal to 3 plus 1, which is equal to 4. We can now use the previous theorem. We just have to check whether it is linearly independent or check if it is a spanning set. So what I will do here is I will check for linear independence. Linear independence only. So recall that to check for linear independence, we have to check this vector equation a1v1 plus a2v2 plus a3v3 plus a4v4 equals the zero vector. The zero vector here is the zero polynomial. This is v1, v2, v3, and v4. If you can still remember from our previous video lecture, the resulting augmented matrix would be this one. I would write here the coefficients. This is the constants. This is for t, t squared, and t cubed. And this is for the column v1, v2, v3, v4. Here, for the first column, I would have 1, 0, negative 2, 1. Because here, this is 1, the coefficient. I don't have a t here, so that's 0, 
for t squared, I have negative 2, and for t cubed, I have 1. For v2, this is t squared minus 4, so this is t squared minus 4 and 0 everywhere. For v3, that's t cubed, so for t cubed, I have 1 plus 2t, then 0 here, and lastly, 5t, so I have 5, 0, 0, 0. And of course, since we're checking for linear independence here, all the entries here would be equal to zero. I will call this matrix the coefficient matrix A. I leave it up to you to check that the determinant of A is equal to negative 35. And therefore, since the determinant is not equal to zero, then this solution has the trivial solution only. A1, A2, up to A4, they are all equal to 0, and therefore, yes, it is linearly independent. Since we have seen that it is linearly independent, then automatically, this is really a basis for P3. You just have to check one condition. Let us look at the relationship between dimension, spanning set, and linear independence. Again, we have a vector space V whose dimension is N and a set whose cardinality is also equal to the dimension of V. First result, if S is linearly independent, then S has at most N elements. Take note that this is saying that you are starting with a linearly independent set. Then S has at most n elements, less than or equal to n. What is the contrapositive of this statement? Let us recall the contrapositive. If you have if P then Q, then this statement is equivalent to you negate the conclusion and then you negate the hypothesis. The contrapositive of this would be, what is the negation of this? S has at most n elements. Then this would mean that if S has greater than n elements, then S is, the negation of this is that S is linearly dependent. And we have already seen this theorem in our last video lecture, correct? If a set has more than n elements where n is the dimension of v, then it is sure to be linearly dependent. And that is that result. Next, if S spans v, then S has at least n elements. What would be the contrapositive of this? Negate this. What do you mean by at least? Greater than or equal to n, right? So this is... If S spans V, then the cardinality of S is greater than or equal to N. The contrapositive of this would be, the negation of this is that if the cardinality of S is less than N, then S cannot span V. So that's this statement over here. If S is less than N elements, then S cannot span V. It's very important that you really memorize this theorem by heart. Here is a summary of what we have learned in our previous slides. Suppose that V is an n-dimensional vector space and S is a set containing vectors in V. First case, if the number of elements in S is less than n, do we know anything about it becoming a spanning set? If it has too few elements, then it cannot span the entire vector space. Do we know anything about its linear independence? No. We still have to check. What about if the cardinality of S is the same as the dimension of your vector space V? We do not know whether it is a spanning set or whether it is linearly independent. However, from our previous theorem, if this is the case, then we only have to check one condition. If it satisfies, let's say, linear independence, then it is already a basis, correct? And since it is a basis, it will already be a spanning set. So remember that you only have to check one condition.
Next, what if the number of elements in S is greater than the dimension of V? What is it that we know of? If it has many elements, then we are sure that it will no longer be linearly independent. It will be linearly dependent. Do we know anything about it being a spanning set? No. We still have to check. Let us look at these examples. Determine whether the following is linearly independent or not. So our S has two elements. The dimension of V is equal to 3 because that is R3. So is it linearly dependent or linearly independent? What do we just know? We just know that if S has more than N elements, then it is linearly dependent. But if S is less than N, then we still have to check. Alright? But since our set S has only two elements, it's very easy to check for linear dependence. Since they are not scalar multiples of each other, yes, it is linearly independent. Next, we have this set S. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Cardinality of S is equal to 5. But the dimension of V is equal to 4. If the cardinality of S is greater than the dimension of V, what do we know? Then the set is linearly dependent. It has way too much elements. What about for its spanning set? So this is the same set that we had earlier. Does this span V? Again, here we have the cardinality of S is less than the dimension of R3. Can we say anything about the spanning set? Yes. If you have few elements, when I say few, I mean it is less than the dimension of your V, then it cannot span your V. For the next example over here, we know that the cardinality of S is equal to 5 and that is greater than the dimension of V because this is equal to 4. What do we know about S being a spanning set if the number of its elements is greater than the dimension of your vector space? We still have to check. What we only know is that if the number of elements is less than the dimension of V, then that is the only way that we can say that it does not span. So here is our set S. We want to check if it spans the entire vector space P3. What do we do? We get an arbitrary element in P3. And let's call that arbitrary element A0 plus A1x plus... And we want to see whether an arbitrary element in V can be written as a linear combination of these five vectors. Let me call this V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. We want to check if there are constants C1, C2 up to C5 such that C1, V1 plus C2, V2. up to C5, V5 will be equal to this one. Let us recall that the augmented matrix that will result from this would be, I will write here, constant x, x squared, and x cubed. For the first column, I have x plus 2. So that is 1 times x plus 2. Everything here is 0. For second vector, it's x squared. So I have 1 and then 0 everywhere. And then next, x cubed minus 1. So that's 1, negative 1, and 0 here. For v4, 3x plus 1. And then for v5, x squared minus 2x plus 3. These are the coefficients. And then this is 0 and we have a0, a1, a2, a3. This is the augmented matrix.
Upon reducing this matrix to its row echelon form, we obtain this matrix. And let us check our pivot columns over here. For the fifth column, we have no pivot here. That means that we have a free variable for the constant C5. So since you have a free variable for C5, that means in particular, this vector equation has infinitely many solutions. So, but the point here is that we can always find such constant. So therefore, the answer here is yes. It spans the entire set P3.